I mean, these things stick out at you that I never observed of before. Well, I hope in our time together, we're gonna to teach you how to observe. You know, we're gonna teach you how to interpret. We're gonna teach you how to um, give application to what you're learning. And for some of you, we're gonna go on even to sermon preparation, give you some, some, um, you know, some preparation on maybe how you can better prepare for a sermon and putting it together. So if you wanna take out your manual with me, of course, I brought out the, the verse, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15. We all know anybody want to hear, right? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is really the purpose of inductive Bible study, right there in a nutshell. Really learning how to rightly divide the word of God. Now, I just want to say this about the Bible, because I think if there's ever a time in our lives, in this age in particular, if you're not sold and you're not committed to the idea is that the Bible is the authority of God, that it's given by God, it has all authority, and that he's, it's divinely inspired for us, um, you, you're going to miss out on everything you get here. When I approach the word of God, I recognize that it has authority over my life. Do you all agree with that? It has authority over me. The problem is, you know, in our day and age, people are judging, you know, the Bible against the tides of our culture. And I said this to our church, you never judge the Bible against the standard of the culture. What you always do is you judge the culture against the standard of the Bible. So when you approach it, you're saying, hey, I, all right, from the beginning, I know this is God's word. It's something he's going to teach me. Doesn't mean I'm going to understand everything. Trust me, I don't understand everything. All the years of going through it, I don't understand. But more is opening up to me. And the beautiful thing about this, even at my age and getting older, I realize I've got so much more to learn, right? It's, it's one of those things you can get excited about. Um, of course, to go through 2 Timothy 3.16, um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And again, I think the Apostle Paul, when he's meeting with the Ephesian elders, and he boldly says to them in Acts 20, verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So my prayer for you is that as we go through this time is that you become hungry to say, gosh, there's so much that I need to learn. And there's so much the Lord wants to teach me. And there's things that you're going to learn here. The beautiful part is you're learning how to feed yourself. You're going to be self-feeders. You're going to be those who don't have any other resources. We're going to talk about that tonight. But you're going to be able to go into the word and say, huh, how does this mean? And how does this tie together with this? And how does this fit with this? And looking at relationships and all that kind of stuff. So if you turn to the next page, kind of see a handprint there. It kind of gives you teach the whole Bible. As you can see, as the Bible is partitioned, and I, I need to say this because I realize that not everybody knows this. I imagine you guys being Calvary people, you do know it, but the Bible is partitioned into different portions. You know, you have the, the Pentateuch. If you look on the next page, in the Old Testament, there's 39 books, right? You have the, the Pentateuch. That's the law of Moses. Uh, when the Bible defines the law, when you go into the New Testament, generally it's referring to the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses, give Genesis through Deuteronomy. There's another section that follows after that. That's kind of the history of the people of Israel. Begins in the book of Joshua and ends in the book of Esther. When you finish that, uh, you go into poetry. Poetry, did you know that Job is poetry? That it's poetry going through the Song of Solomon. There's five books that are poetry. And then you have uh, prophecy, Isaiah through Malachi. And so um, when you look at this, the thing I want you to understand, it's not necessarily chronological. Uh, perhaps um, you'll see that when you go through history, that a lot of the prophets actually intersperse 
in that together. They're kind of the dispersal of the whole history of Israel. They'll come up at different places. Um, poetry. You'll see different phrases of poetry coming up, you know, through Psalms and whatever. Um, you have First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings. These books are actually parallel. They're giving you different viewpoints depending on who you are. Some look to the northern tribes of Israel. Others look to the southern tribe of Judah, um, Judah and Benjamin. So again, I'm going to just go over this real quick. I don't want to overwhelm you with a bunch of stuff here. But there's different genres. And depending on what kind of genre you're going to study, it's going to be a little bit different technique. However, the same principles are going to be in all of them. And the New Testament, you again, you have partitioned. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are called narratives. These are books that tell you what's happened, or you could call them his, um, historical. They're giving you the events of Jesus, each account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's one book of history in the New Testament. That's the book of Acts, which we did not so long ago in church. And then we go through the epistles, which we're making our way through now on Sundays. And so you have, you know, Romans through Jude are called, these are didactic teachings. These are teachings that aren't necessarily stories telling you about things that happened. They're giving you teaching. And from those teachings, you begin to draw out what is the author thinking? when he gives this to me? What was he trying to communicate? What was he trying to drive home? See, one of the things that, that we mistakenly do is we take scripture and we don't look at it in context. And we don't look at it in a sense of saying, oh, what in the world is you know, this particular passion, pass, or passage trying to teach me? What is it showing me? And so we can take a verse and we can take it out of context and really, that's where you get a lot of false teaching. When you look at any false teaching you're going to get today, generally, it's going to have some truth mixed in with it. But the thing is, it's going to be very out of context. If you remember when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness, what does he use to tempt him? Anybody? Scripture. He comes at him with Scripture, but it's out of context. Jesus corrects him with Scripture in context. So giving you this, equipping you with this is really teaching you how to discern what is truth from lies. You can discern, you know, what is error from what is true. And once you begin to get a good handle on it, you know, when you hear something false or somebody takes a verse, and they make a whole message out of it, but it doesn't fit the passage, you're going to go, oh, man, that's really fishy. And I hope that this really comes home to you as you go through this. Um, so kind of uh, looking at genres then, you can see the next page, genres. You have the historic, which is narrative, historical events, Old Testament history, gospels, and acts, all right? We'll also have a section that you can teach a little bit unique from historical, which is parables learning how to understand the parables, how to look at them, how to study them. Then you have didactic teaching, like I say, and that's the epistles of Paul, of Peter, of John. Um, you know, these are, these are teachings. And then you have the poetry of, of course, jo Job through Psalms. And then you have the prophetic section. Now, when we talk about inductive method, what we're talking about is taking from what is there and pulling out from what is there, from no place else. What we're going to be doing in here in the next week is we're going to be pulling out from the passage itself. We're not going to look at outside resources. We're going to look from the passage itself and draw out some facts about it. You guys are going to learn how to be detectives. You're going to learn how to look at something and see the who, what, where, when, how, and why. And you're going to be able to put the pieces together so that you can get the full meaning about what is taking place. Now, when I explain IBS, the, in, I, the inductive Bible study method, IBS, has been used for many years and has proven to be very effective. It is objective and impartial to any text. In contrast to a deductive method, which starts with a premise or an idea and moves to prove it, that idea from different texts, the inductive method never starts with a premise. 
It's not trying to pull pieces together. You're starting only with what is there. The IBS method simply comes from the text itself to discover what it says. The IBS method attempts to discover the facts of a text through careful, thoughtful, there's the key words I want you to remember, three of them, observation, learning how to observe what is there, and from what you observe to draw an interpretation of the facts to understanding the intent of the author. When a writer gives us these books in the Bible, he has a thought process. He's thinking through something. You're not, you, we don't relate to that because we look at you know, verses and take verses and sections, but there's a thought process of an author. When Paul writes Romans, it's a masterpiece. He's taking you through a thought process. It's very, it's very um, I mean, it's very educated when you look at it. He, he actually gives you a thesis, and he tells you how he comes to the conclusions he comes to so that when you get to the end of the book in the last chapters, as we saw, it's all about application. Because these things are true, this is what we do with what we know, right? This is what we do. So when we go through um, inductive Bible study, we're pulling from the facts that are there. We're not trying to pull anything in. Um, deductive, as we said, that starts off with, I got an idea, I have to find scripture that's going to kind of back that up. And there's a lot of teaching out there like that. And it's not always necessarily bad. In fact, usually when you go to topical sermon, somebody's taking a lot of those different facts from good founded scripture, and they're putting them together to bring home a truth. But that's not what we're doing in here. And then you have, of course, springboard teaching. That's um, when somebody gets up there and shares a lot of their opinion, but none of the scripture. You guys ever been around that? Ever seen it? I don't think you do here, for sure. But there's a lot of it out there. There's a lot of opinions that are going out. The next sheet you're going to see is a Bible study chart. Before we go any farther, do I have any questions anybody want to ask? I, I don't want to lose anybody in the process. I'm going to try to make this as basic and as simple as we can. Don't be ashamed. If you've got a question, just ask it. I'm, I don't bite, I promise. My wife does, but anyway. Again, on this left of this Bible study chart here, you look at forms, there's narrative, right? Uh, accounts of events such as the Gospels, Acts, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, etc. Also records, records the Old Testament kings. Then you have epistles, which are the letters. Those are the letters in the New Testament. Logical development of a subject. Paul's letters such as Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, etc. The writings of Peter, James, John, and Jude. Poetry, the arrangement of ideas with patterns. There's a rhythm to poetry. There's always a cause, there's an effect, there's, there's, there's a balance of, of ideas that are brought beautifully home in the Psalms as you go through them. Proverbs, through the teachings, they, they bring you one thing and they balance that with something else. The parables, of course, and found in all the Gospels, Jesus' teaching. These are stories that Jesus uses to illustrate biblical truth, to make sure that the, the, those who are following him can understand. And lastly, prophecy, Old Testament, all the way through Revelation. Um, the prophets used two types of prophecy to communicate their message. One was predictive. That's when they would tell you what is going to take place in the future. Um, and then there's this didactive form, which kind of deals with the current moral, ethical, or theological truths. In other words, things that God might be saying today. And I believe, um, in my own experience, there are definitely New Testament prophets who know what God's word is for the day that we live in. They're not going to contrast or go against what's in his word, but they have a good pulse or a sense. God is speaking a message to this generation. And I think every pastor, to a degree, has that. I know I've heard from Rory many times. You know, it's a sense of what's going on in the world, and God, what are you saying at this particular time? And when the Holy Spirit, you know, opens up your heart to that, you just kind of get lit on fire. Next thing what I want to look at here is the basic principles of inductive. These are the key things. 
Hope you memorize them. I hope you get them in your head. I hope they become a part of your thinking when you read the Bible as we go through this. Observation, interpretation, and application. Observation helps us to see what the text is saying. And basically, it'll follow a process of reading the text several times, recording your first impressions of what you see, and then record who, what, where, and when. Now, from that observation, you'll then go into interpretation. What does the text mean? And it's not so much, um, you know, what does it mean to me? I mean, that's kind of where we go with this because we get into application. But it's looking at the passage itself. You interpret it literally. You're going to learn to study it in context. Let the scripture interpret scripture. You don't have to make this hard. The scripture can do this. Um, New Testament takes precedence. And again, I was, remember being so frustrated in school, going, why aren't they taking something so simple and making it so hard? Which in truth was, I was the one who couldn't rightly understand the word because I didn't follow through with these principles. They weren't a part of my life. They, I learned to let them be a part of my life. But finally, you become to application. I realize that's not spelled right, application. Need to repair that. You all got your application there with you? Okay. Sounds good. Someone needs to apply something. I see that. But this really answers the question, if this is true and this is true, then how should I respond? Seeing these facts, I take the facts of what I've observed. I've taken the facts of what I've interpreted. How does this, what does this now mean to me? What sins might it be addressing in my own life or errors that I need to avoid Maybe promises that I need to believe, commands to obey. What are the examples that I can see for myself in this? Now, we are going to be tonight, where are we at? Good, we're in pretty good shape. We're going to be beginning tonight looking at historical section. We're going to be learning narrative in the next few weeks. We're not going to be doing didactive. We're not going to be doing poetry. We're not going to be doing, um, um, what's the other, Histo uh, we're doing historical poetry, what's, prophecy, right. We're not going to go into that. However, these same principles you use in every form of studying. So it's not like um, you're not going to have it all the way through. These things you learn. So we're going to look at uh, preparation. Now, you all should have in your hand worksheets. One, you'll see it's an observation. It looks like this. The other is interpretation, where you take those facts that you get from the observation, begin to write down what you're learning. You're going to look and learn to discipline yourselves to look at the relationships. What words are repeated? What ideas are repeated? What concepts are repeated? What ones are contrasted? Which ones make a difference? You'll see, uh, you're going to learn how to take a passage and look and try to discipline yourself to find what is the main idea of this passage. Now, one of the things that um, you're going to see here is that when we go through this, uh, you're going to do a, a breakdown sheet. And I want to stress this with you as far as inductive Bible study in this class. Never use a study Bible when you're doing this. So I have sheets. You'll see one that says assignment one. That is a passage. It's from the King, New King James. We're going to go through it together, but it doesn't have a title on it. I want you to come up with your own title when we go through a passage. I want you to come up with what you would say. You, most of you in your Bibles, they're already broken down into sections when you read through. And typically, they're going to give you a, a, uh, a title of a different section. I have a really cool thing I do with some people. If you ever want to learn, it's called um, title memorization, where you learn from titles to walk your way through the New Testament. And I have a 
many guys over the years could tell you every, what's in every chapter in the New Testament, just from going off the titles, and they're learning the same thing. So it's a whole different discipline of, of memorizing stuff. But um, never use a study Bible. Get away from commentaries. You're not looking at outsource, outsourcing material. But I do recommend that you get a really good dictionary because there's some words, an English dictionary, because there's some words you're going to want to look at and say, huh, what does that mean? You know, that in itself is a very exciting thing to do. Right, Roy? Right? Because all of a sudden, one little word you're looking at and you go, man, what's the deal here? And you look at that word and it just jumps out at you. Something new, something you didn't see before. So I do encourage you to have a good dictionary. When you see a word that you're going through, you're not sure what it means, or it's something you want to maybe kind of grab a better understanding of it, um, I'm going to encourage you to look at that. Um, Next rule is never read into the story what isn't there. This is called eisegesis. It means you're reading into. We're not reading into, we're taking out of. Where do you begin? All right, you win, uh, before you write anything down, ask the Lord to open your heart and your mind to what he has to minister to you through these verses. Read the story or stories you're studying five to ten times. Get very familiar with the passage. Don't rush yourselves. Take a couple of days maybe sometimes and then sit down and do your study and the passage will become all the more familiar. So just don't try to speed through a passage. Don't try to just sit down and do an observation without first getting a glimpse of the big picture. Now, these, again, these portions we're going to be going through in assignments, these are portions that have a title, but I want you to kind of work through them together and see what you can come up with. Um, Observation. You're starting by doing your observation chart and what you will list looking at the who, what, where, when, and why. Do you guys see this here? Who, what, where, when, and why. Listing each verse. All right. As you can see, the first assignment's pretty long. You're going to need more than one of these to actually do the whole thing. So, um, but you're looking at the who. Who is speaking or present in that particular verse? When? Does it say anything about a timing change? Early in the morning, late in the day, etc. cetera. Um, where? What's the location? Is it on the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, synagogue? Where, where is this taking place? Is it in Jerusalem? And sometimes where we're jumping in, we're not going to know. And the only way you would know where that is, how would you learn that? What's that? Context, you would have to go back, right? You have to go back and say, all right, where are we in this particular passage? As you go through the Gospels, you realize that Jesus is going from Galilee down to Jerusalem, out to Ituria. You know, he goes back up to Galilee, down through Samaria, you know, back to, you know, Idumea, and then he makes his way up to Jerusalem again. So there's all this shifting going on, and you want to pay attention because Jesus is really, his presentation is unique and all those places. Galilee, for instance, is a bumpkin land. It would have been in the Prineville of its day. You know, it would have been the place that anybody from Jerusalem would have thought anybody from the north is a bunch of hicks. And the funny thing is, when you go there today, it's kind of the same thing. They still view the people of the north kind of hicks. That's why I talk about Jesus coming from Nazareth. You know, can anything good come from there? What good is that? Capernaum was just a, you know, it's a, it's a town, and there was activity there, but compared to Jerusalem, you know, it's, there's not a whole lot going on. And as you go through your studies, these places become more alive to you. Uh, so that if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, anybody been? All right, yeah, when you go there and you go, oh, man, all of a sudden it just all stands out to you. I can see it now. I can see the story. You make your way from Galilee down to uh, Jerusalem and make your way down the Negev and you see some of the stories where Abraham was. You go, oh man, it's all making sense. That's what I think is so exciting about this. After a while, it just begins to click. You begin to read stuff and go, whoa. 
I mean, I, after, after all these years of teaching the Bible, what I'm going through now, it's like I'm still seeing this stuff that I'm like going, man, there's so much to this. And when you think of it on your own people, it's different than when Rory's telling you. I'm not saying it's better. It's different. Why? Because you are seeing it yourself. And when you see it yourself, something happens to you. It's like, God, this is good. I didn't know this was even possible. You're looking at locations. You're looking at what is going on, you know, the reason for it. Um, and these will be clarified as you go through each story. Now, when we talk about in, interpretation, oh, excuse me, I'll go on the next page. When facts are repeated from one verse to the next or no change has been made, for instance, you're in verse one, the same, per, nothing has changed as far as location or person, just do a quotation mark. That way you can always look up to where you are or what's going on instead of writing facts over and over again. As you work on your study, you'll find words that you need greater understanding. This is where the dictionary comes in. You write them down in the back of your sheet. Say, I'm gonna make note of this. I wanna look up this word. And you're gonna maybe be surprised how greater your understanding is gonna be. Um, look at words like reason or cause. Um, how does that work? There's a cause, there's an effect. Look like, uh, you know, you have that word therefore in scripture. And I know you've heard this a thousand times. What does it mean? What it's there for, right? It caused you to question what's, where we're coming from. I'm passing on, if these things are true, therefore I have to go on here. So you're looking at those kind of effects. Look for repeated words, ideas, contrast. The author has a point and he's trying to drive it home to the reader. And it's your job to understand what he's saying. Now you're gonna have an observation sheet for every story. Um, stop real quick, any questions? Anybody have any questions at all? Oh, without that? Yeah. Well, that's why I gave these, um, these sheets here. There's an assignment one, which is the passage itself. And what I want us to do is we're all gonna work from that same assignment, the same passage, so that we can all get an idea of what we're doing, okay? Does that sound clear to you? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I printed them up just so that we would have that. Uh, you're going to be tempted to go into your own Bible and look it up and cheat. <laughs> yeah, ignore the headings. Um, if anything, you, you may come up with the exact same heading that they have there, but maybe you come up with something more creative. You'll find that different Bibles will give you different headings when they go into a story. Yeah. What's that? The Corinthians that you're talking about for the passages, they were only going to speak to the last. You should have an assignment sheet. Do you all have one? The, the printout for, of the passage is just for the equipped class. Or the, oh, just for the equipped class. But I'm assuming everybody wants to learn this. Am I, am I correct? Yes. So I would invite you, everybody who's here, even if you're not in the equip, get this. Pick up on it. You know, you may develop it more thoroughly later, but I just encourage you um, to, to get a hold of this now and start to really familiarize yourself with it. Yeah? Just a Webster. Yeah, just a regular, good, maybe a little older Webster. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Words don't mean the same as they used to. Yeah. 
Yeah, he used to mean happy. Yeah. Well, I think, you know what it is? It's, it's logic when you think about it. For me, as I've gotten through it over the years, I go, man, this is just logical. So I don't know who first developed it. I know in Calvary Chapel, it became a big thing probably 35 years ago. Um, most of you, maybe if you've ever come from that background, it was always a very big deal wherever we were, um, inductive Bible studies. So, um, so you're going to be more keen on it. A lot of your denominations don't, don't really care how you, they're just glad if you do read the Bible. But you're saying, no, I don't want to just read the Bible. I want to understand it, and I want to take it to heart. Casey, you had a question earlier, did you? Oh. Okay. Interpretation. I want to go over this. Again, observation, interpretation. What does the passage mean? All right? I'm seeing, I'm observing who it is, where it is, you know, the how and all that kind of stuff. But what is that saying to me? The spiritual truth is the lessons from every story. Here's some questions that'll help you. What has the Lord ministered to you in this story? What lessons does the passage teach? Why is the author bringing it up? How would I explain this story to another believer? How would I explain this to an unbeliever? And I put down, don't be in a hurry. Learn and pray and the Lord will show you. So what a lot of people to do when they get into interpretation, some of you are going to be stronger in one part than you are in other parts, all right? Some of you are going to be stronger in observation. Some of you are going to do better interpretation. When we go through the interpretation, that's a little bit more difficult for more, most people because they think interpretation is kind of retelling the story, kind of paraphrasing it. That's not what it is. Interpretation is trying to learn from the story, what is it teaching me? And I'm learning that Jesus has power over nature. I'm learning that, um, you know, that there's multitudes of people, or in this particular section, Jesus is talking only to his disciples. At other times, he's talking to the vast crowds. That becomes really key in some of your passages. Jesus, you'll find often he takes his disciples aside and he gives them their own personal course. You know, he's teaching them something, but you'll see that when you do inductive. You know, who is he talking to? You're not limited to how many lessons can come from a story. In fact, look for as many as possible. You want to discover the truths that are there. Um, examine the story. There can be many different aspects of the story. When looking at the story, you might want to look at the section from Jesus' point of view, the people's point of view, or the disciples' point of view. Take a picture and find out what's there. Be kind of that fly on the wall. Put yourself in the moment. You know, discipline yourselves to examine the passage as thoroughly as possible. When writing down your interpretation, always start with this pattern. In this passage, we learn that. Blank, 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 whatever you're learning. And again, I write here, important, don't just paraphrase a story. The living, uh, the living Bible is a paraphrased version. Try to tell what you're learning and with a conclusion you're coming up to with your reading it. Keep it simple. Look for the simple, the obvious meanings. So many times people spend a lot of time trying to so find something while completely missing the thing is right in front of their eyes. And that's true. You can completely miss the most simple thing trying to look for something deeper. And I've, I've been around that for all these years. Relationships. This is an important step that I hope to drive home in the next week. So I'm going to go over all these things again. Janet's going to be here with me. Uh, Daryl's gone through inductive. We can, we can help any of you as you go through this stuff uh, to try to better get a handle on it. Um, uh, don't forget to look at similar words, ideas, helping you find relationships in these stories. Remember to do this to all the previous stories. When we are done with assignment one and we get into assignment two and you're finished with it, I'm going to have you look and see what similarities are with 
the first assignment with the second assignment. But things kind of cross over. Now, I have to tell you, when I was in school, we, we had these, we had charts that would be a, a, as long as a stage almost. We'd tap, we'd tape each page to each page. We'd take the stories and which ideas, how's is this related over here? So we had to really became kind of complex that way. What we're doing is not that. But it is something that's going to really give you a good handle on what you're doing. Um, main idea. Again, what's the title of that portion? What is the theme you would look for? Um, try to use as few words as possible. That's a good discipline, by the way. Taking a big chunk, how would you sum up that chunk in just a few words? Over the years in developing sermons, I always had to do that. I had to take this portion of scripture and then try to put it down, and Roy does the same thing. You put it down into a passage that best describes. Roy brings that on Sunday morning. He gives it a title. And then he kind of shows you why that title is the title. He's actually doing inductive for you when he does that. Then finally, and this is the goal of all of it, it is the idea of um, application. We don't learn the Bible just to learn facts. You guys know that? The goal of all Bible study is what? Transformation. It's like we want to be able to apply what we have. Over the years, I've met so many believers who are very solid in their knowledge of the word. What they don't have is this concept of, Lord, what are you showing me in this? How, what do you want to change in my life? What do you want to do in me through this? How do I need to correct my understanding of you? And I pray that as you get to this portion of application, that that becomes all the more meaningful to you. You know, remember the application is the goal of Bible study. You want to apply it to your life. Steps to apply as you go through with what the Lord shows you. Make plans and steps. What can I do? If God is showing me this, what can I do to make a change in my life? If he's showing something about my life that, that is maybe his word has confronted me with, because we all know the Bible's a mirror, isn't it? When we look through it, it has a way of exposing us for who we are. That is the work of the Holy Spirit because he's bringing, seeking to bring transformation into our lives. So as you're going through what's the Lord shown you, uh, God desires to use his word to change your life. So you also have the interpretation sheet. Y'all got that? That's the second form. The second form is what you're going to use to pull together what you learned in the observation. In the interpretation, you're going to write down the different truths that you're going to get from this first portion. You're going to look at the relationships. What words are the same? Which ones are different? What contrasts are there? How does this relate to, um, you know, between Peter and John? How, do, how, does it, how are they relating to one another? You're looking at the contrast and beginning to pull it out. Looking at the main idea and then showing how am I going to apply it. So what I want to do is I want to take about 10 minutes. And if you can find something you're going to need to write with, and hopefully next week what we may do is break you down into tables as we do some of these exercises so that putting maybe six of you together at a time, um, and you can go through with each other and kind of go through and glean what you're observing together. But when we come back, we're going to take out assignment number one, and I'm going to show you how we're going to go through that. But before we do, any questions? If you have a question, just come up to me at any time during a break or whatever. But let's take a, about a 10-minute break, walk around, get your head clear. Anybody confused? Are you? Okay, that's fine. You can be confused, I am too.
we're, we're, in, we're in night number one. And we're going to be going through, over these things again and again. So each, each time you're going to have a better understanding of what we're doing, okay? Um, be patient. Again, ask the Lord to teach you. So let's take 10 minutes. Let's meet back here at um, 713. 14. Ready, everyone? Let's all get back in place. We're going to get started again. I love the noise. I like it when people get excited. That's good. Um, what we're going to do right now, and by, by the way, I was telling somebody that um, they wanted to know if, if I always chart everything when I do my studies, and the answer is no. But, but I do tell you that I learned to read the Bible differently. And I've learned to read the Bible using all these things. Now, as I, as I look, I'm much more careful to observe all these things, much more careful about my interpretation um, and even my application. So the goal isn't to teach you to chart for the rest of your life. The, co the goal is to teach you how to think through a passage on your own and to be able to go through it and say, okay, I, I'm understanding what this says. And hopefully, when we're all said and done, we're not going to be going a thousand different directions. We're going to hopefully see a lot of things the same, okay? Now, what, <clears throat> anybody else bothered by the smoke? Man, my, my voice, man. Wow, it's just killing my voice. Do you have an assignment, assignment number one? And again, the reason we have assignments and I'm giving to you and written out is because I don't want you to have the stuff that a study Bible would give you. <clears throat> I want you to be able to think through this passage. So if you have assignment one and then you have this observation sheet, pull that out. You got a pen with you. And we're going to go through some verses together. And I'm going to let you work on the rest of this story hopefully going through verse 20. You're going to probably need another observer, observation sheet because this is a longer passage. A couple of the assignments are shorter. One's very short. But um, as you go through this. Now, when we go through Mark, verse 1, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. I want you to take that and observe it. Then... Um, who, who do you see there? Who, what do you see? They, how do we know who they are? Go back. So you'd go back in your Bible. We know who they are. Do you guys have a good sense of the, who they are? The disciples, right. And, and with, along with Jesus. To the, other, to the other side, what's the, do you see anything there for the wind? Yeah, that's probably the only word that's going to give you a connection as far as timing. You know, we saw it in Mark. Um, that word immediately keeps coming up. It kind of shows you this succession of thoughts. So this is picking up from the former story. Then they all came. Where? To the, where? To the country. What else? Other side of the sea. How would you find out what sea they're talking about? You'd go back and see where they, they've been, right? They're up in northern uh, Israel on the Sea of Galilee. That's going to kind of be where Jesus has his head, headquarters at this point. The Gadarenes, do you, you don't know who they are, do you? So you're going you're gonna to hold on to that. All we know is that they're one place and they've crossed over the sea to the other side. You don't know that. When you're all done with your study, you'd probably go up and look and find out the Gadarenes is a place on the, um, uh, on the north side of the shore, and it is, excuse me, it would be on the south side of the shore. And it's um, a, a pagan place. This is where they would raise pigs. There were a bunch of heathen people over there who had no heart for the Jews. You don't know that at this point, but you would look that up at some point and try to figure out 
what's so key about that. So they cross over the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. All right? Anything else you see? What about a what? Why? We really don't see a whole lot about a what or why they're doing. So unless you see something, you don't have to put it down. All right? Verse 2. Yeah, you could do that, yeah. Now, you're not going to find that in a dictionary. So you would probably want to do that, either do a Google search or something like that. And I'll let you do that. Other than that, you're just going to take regular words. By the way, are there any words in there that you might want to key on? on? Not necessarily. Verse 2. Who, what about the Who? What's the who? Jesus. Jesus, right? He, right? He, we know they're talking about Jesus. What happens? Who else? I mean, who else do we find there in that who? Okay, man with an unclean spirit. Do we know where? Yeah, we know he's in the Gadarenes, right? He's on this side of the lake. If you're putting that down, on the, you, you would go on the other side on the shore. It'd be a good um, Gadarenes, the man in the tombs. And what do we find out about the man in the tombs? What is the what there? Yeah, he has an unclean spirit, which means what? Yeah, he's demon-possessed. He's possessed by a demon, all right? Verse 3. Are you guys coming along? You're right, be able to write that in your... Here, I'll be more patient. Yeah, immediately it would be a good time. Yeah. It's a timing. It's a progression. It says it, it's happening. It's like as soon as he got on shore, this guy shows up, right? In verse 3, who? The demon-possessed man, right. When? Anything in there? About timing? What? What's going on there? What do we see? He, he, okay, you're learning that he's... But we don't learn that in verse 3, though. Oh, no, you're right, it does. No one could bind him, not even his chains. Um, so we're learning he... So we knew he came out of the tomb, but now we're learning that he lives. He lived among the tombs, all right? So you might want to put that in the what? He lives among the tombs. He's uncontrollable. Nothing... No one can control him at all, not even with chains. And again, that word dwelling there is interesting because he might be a word you might want to highlight, look it up, bring to light a little bit more. He's dwelling. What does that mean? Dwelling. It's where the guy lives. This is his life. Months, a bunch of dead people. Verse f four, we all moving on? Yeah. 
Any questions from anybody right now? Yeah. Yeah. Gatherings, right? Yeah, if we were if we were going through the story through Mark itself, we would have followed Jesus making his way to the Sea of Galilee and all the events that kind of preceded this. So this would all make a lot of sense to us. He's at one part of the sea. People are now surrounding him, and so he gets in the boat and he goes to the other side of the sea. No doubt an attempt to break away with his disciples and get some personal time. Um, <clears throat> but we're not... We're not coming from there because we're starting at this place. But when we go into the next assignments, we're going to build on what we see here as it relates to the next assignment. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Verse 4. Who is the who? Same guy. Again, you could use your quotation marks, your quote marks. Um, what do you see there? Yeah, he's, he's really strong, abnormally strong, right? How do we know that? His shackles are broken to pieces. Right. No matter what, you know, that one verse above says they couldn't control him. I mean, he is one person who is insanely strong. Um, if you've ever been around demon-possessed people and they manifest, you realize that there's <laughs> there can be a lot of a lot of power there. And he's manifesting. He's and been living in this place of darkness for so long. This is where he lives. Nothing can hold him down. He's in shackles. But even though shackles aren't strong enough to hold him, he's that mad, he's that crazy, he's that possessed that he has supernatural strength. Is there a when in there at all? A what? Is there a when in that verse? On four? It's just often possessing the context of the fifth verse to not be in the exact time. Yeah. I mean, it just says it often. You know, he would, he would try to break away. That's yeah. more of a frequency than the time. Yeah, it is more of a frequency. You could put that in the interpretation. Okay. Verse 5. Who? Same guy. Same guy? Any win there? Yeah, it's when it says always, it's talking about what? It's something that continuously happening. Not a particular time frame. It's something that is continually happening with him. Ongoing, right. What, what, but there is something there, a win, where you could, could look at night and day. I mean, this is like happening all the time. So it's not like he's just, you know, it's a fluke thing that he shows up with Jesus. This guy has been living this way for a very long time. What about the where? Yeah, among the tombs and the mountains, what would he do? What? Yeah, he's cutting himself with stones. What else is he doing there? He's crying out. He's in misery. And again, when you come into this, you, you begin to try to pick up the depth of this. This guy is one scary 
miserable man. Now, you could read through that, but you're not going to get the depth of that as what you just got. You could read through that, but you're not going to really get into the depth of what there is being described to us. This is a man who is hopeless, right? He's a man who nothing's been able to help him. The people will find out are afraid of him. Night and day, he's in the mountains and he's crying out. He's cutting himself with stones. Verse 6, who's the who? Jesus and the man, right? What happens? He saw Jesus and then he worshiped Jesus. He sees him, he worships him. In verse 7, Yeah, so we can't assume that Jesus has gone up to the tombs, right? He's come out of the tombs, and he's, gre- he's greeting Jesus at the, shore. at the shore. Yeah, that would be my idea of what I see there. What's that? No, it just says, well, you, you get the idea that as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, yeah. that he makes his way to him. I mean, I would, I would say, I mean, if you want, the idea is that as soon as he gets out of the boat, he sees Jesus. Yeah, the, the rest of this is sort of parenthetical. It's yes. It's in the context of, like, who this guy is. Right. It's really, we're going from immediately there he met him. Right. He, he ran and worshipped him. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Verse 7. Who is the who? Oh, yeah. Well, you're going to get to that when you get into interpretation. That's when you're kind of putting the facts of what you observed. You know, here's a man, he's been troubled. Um, He's uncontrollable. He's possessed by a demon. Um, Nothing has been able, and he sees Jesus, right? And he recognizes him to the point that he goes up and falls before him and worships him, you know? So um, that's going to be like your interpretation. I learned here that this demon-possessed man recognized Jesus. Some of your interpretation, you're going to find it, Different interpretations that we go through there, but we're going to go through this probably next week in our, our section to go into interpretation stuff. Can you write that observation down on the back? Yeah, you could write that observation down in the back, and then. So, like, if you're saying you recognize Jesus, you write it on the back of the observation piece, too, or whatever. Yeah, he, he came running to Jesus, yeah. And that's a good question when you read this. How is it that he knows who Jesus is? And, and um, Rory taught on this a couple of weeks ago, or somebody did on, on uh, Wednesday night. Was that you? Yeah, Daryl. Yeah. Daryl, it was you. And you made sense. Wow. That's, that was just amazing. I was just like, <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> Verse 7. What happens? Who's the he? And it says to Jesus, yeah, he questions Jesus. Or, um, yeah, he, he questions Jesus. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's basically um, looking at your what. There is no really when there. 
He's still on the shore. He's on his, he's on his face. And he says, what do I have with, do with you, Jesus, son of the most high? He recognizes, what he, what's the interpretation is, he recognizes Jesus. That's very key there. He recognizes Jesus, question, your son of the most high. Now, let me ask you a question here. Do you think that the demon is the one who recognizes him or the man? Obviously. That's the kind of the conclusion you come to when you begin to put your pieces together. Um, and he said to him, uh, wait, I implore by God that you do not torment me. So he has an understanding of what, what, are we, what does he seem to understand? That Jesus has authority, right, over them. And again, that's more in the interpretation section, but the pieces are starting to come out. With the man, obviously he was, he was inside of the man. Yep. So, yeah, that's the whole idea behind it. But it's more the demon talking at this point. And you'll feel, that'll be much clearer as we go further into the passage, right? So it's the demon who's talking, asking Jesus, you know, he recognizes him and his authority. You're the son of the most high God. And then he implores him not to torment me. Anybody see anything else there you want to add? And again, when you look at this stuff, it doesn't seem so complex, does it? But the thing I hope you get and see here tonight is you're seeing things you probably haven't seen before. You're observing things you probably haven't observed before. You're getting an understanding of the depth of this man's condition, perhaps in a way you've never heard it before. And when someone with inductive teaching teaches you this, they kind of highlight how destitute this demon-possessed man really is. He's lost. But he also is so desperate that when he sees Jesus, he moves toward, I think he, he moves toward Jesus, and it's the demon inside of him that actually drives his actions at that point. It seems to be what you put together. Well, I mean, obviously, he's, he's frightened, wouldn't you say? Yeah. He's frightened of Jesus. He recognizes Jesus as power to do something to him. Yeah. And so he fears that. He also identifies Yeah, he identifies him. That's, that's a good in your, what, in your what? He identifies Jesus. He questions Jesus. And what does he beg Jesus to not do? Don't torment me. Now, the guy inside has been tormented for a long, long time. The demon here is kind of, in his own way, asking for what? He's asking for mercy. Because he recognizes he's met his match. Verse 8. Who? Is, is there a when? Where hasn't changed? What changes? Jesus responds to the man. He's responding to him. What's that? He's responding to the demon. Yeah, yeah, correctly. Yeah. And what does he do? He 
he, com com he gives a command, right? He commands the demon. That would be a what? He's, what's this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that ver verse 9, that kind of gives you the answer to that. He is who? Jesus, right? Asked him. Who's the him there? The demoniac. What does he ask him? What is your name? And he, who's the he? The man answered saying, what? My name is Legion, for we are many. What does that tell you right there? It's more than one demon. You know what, you know what legion means? Get your dictionary. Look it up. What does the legion mean? There's a bunch. This guy is full of them. There's many of us. What's that? Well, he's saying I don't have. He's saying I don't have one name, but it's interesting. He has to answer Jesus. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Jesus, he has to answer him. It's like he, Jesus is in control of the situation. That's what I see. He's controlling the situation. He asks the man, "What is your name?" He has to answer him. He says, "There's not just me. There's a bunch of us. We're all having a party here together. We we live in this man." We've been tormenting him, yeah. What's the definition of legion? It's a Roman term created to identify a contingency of three to six thousand men. Three to six thousand men? Yeah. Yeah. So three to six thousand demons. Yeah, there matches the definition. Yeah, whether, and whether Jesus or whether it's met metaphorically or yeah. there's exactly that many, you don't, you don't know. But what he's saying is there's a whole lot of us. And we're all living here. And um, and verse verse ten, who is the who? The demon. What's he do? He begs who? What? Yeah, it, it, you know, what's, what's not really clear is whether, you know, the man who's filled with these demons, whether he goes searching out to see this one who comes on shore. And then the demons respond as he's making his way. I mean, that's, you could, there's no definite way you could really say for sure. But they live in the flesh. They dwell within. These are spirits that dwell within. Has anybody here been around? I don't want to get into it necessarily. Well, that's what you got to get through here. Is that what? Because what does he? What does he ask? He's begging him that he won't send him someplace else or them. What is he acknowledging there? What is it? 
that he has the power and the authority to do that. And the assumption by these demons is that now that they've encountered the Son of God, why would the Son of, why would they be aware, why would the demons be aware of Jesus as the Son of God? Daryl, you should answer that. Yeah, Daryl brought that out. It's a beautiful point too. It's like, and during the, during the fall, they would have they would have known by his character, like Jesus. Um, they recognized what even the Pharisees didn't recognize. You know how James says that even the demons tremble at his name. They know what's going on more than a lot of humans know what's going on. So they recognize Jesus. Um, when he comes, and they also recognize he has authority over them, he tells them what to do. And they beg him not to do certain things. Um, they're, they're begging him what? Not to send them out of the country. They know he has authority to drive them out. And they fear because they don't know. In verse 11, who? <laughs> Herd of swine. <laughs> We're present, right? They're feeding near the mountains. So on the hillside somewhere near the, where all this is taking place, they're feeding Oh, yeah, near the mountains? That's the only change you would see, but it kind of specifies. I'm not thinking that that's necessarily away from where they are, but I'm just thinking that, remember, this is where they raise pigs. This is why we know this is Gentile territory. So these swine are feeding near the mountains. The wind, yeah, the wind's continuous, right? We don't see any shift. Unless there's a real pronounced shift, you don't, you don't make it. So we see here, the observation is that the um, swine are feeding there near the mountains, so they're not far away. And so the demons, now we look at the word plural here, demons, who demons begged him, who's him? What is their plea? Yeah, send us to the pigs, the swine, so that we may enter them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you'd really necessarily call the demons the who, but it does describe basically what's going on. What did you say? Uh, so the demon that's referred to as like legion at this point is going on. Whatever. Demons. They're using the word demons here. So what, what I want you to do is for the next 10 minutes, on your own, I want you to go through and see what you get. See if you can get down to verse 20. And then when we come back, I'm going to answer questions because I'm sure you're going to have some. Okay? Hopefully you have something to write on, something hard. Again, I think next week I'm going to see if we can get some tables in here and we'll break up in tables so that you guys can work on it together. Does everybody have enough of the worksheets, observations? Should have two. Is everybody doing okay? Everybody done or you're, anybody still need more time? I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have you finish those at home if you haven't finished them. 
take them home and finish them, bring them back next week. Because next week, when we come back together, we're going to be going into the interpretation portion. Um, and we're going to take the things we've learned from the observation. What have we been learning in this? Can anybody give me just a couple things? We've been talking about them, but what? Yeah. To draw out of it from these particular story here, what what lessons are we learning? Okay, yeah. The authority that Jesus has. How do we know that? Yeah. So we, we, we know that he has authority. What else we learn there in that passage? They, they recognize Jesus, right? And when we come back next week, we're gonna go, I want you guys to think through that. All right? I want you to think of the things that you're learning. We're going to come back and put it together. We're going to try to um, discipline ourselves to see if we can find any relationships in that passage. Are there any words that are used over and over again? Any ideas that are used over and over again? But right now, tonight, the key idea is looking at observation. And you guys, you feel like you're getting a handle on that? It's not too complicated. Anybody having a struggle? Don't be ashamed if you are. I remember when I took it, I said, oh, why are they making this so hard? It's, it's not that hard. And I'm hoping to convey that to you. It's really not. Yes. It's a discipline. It is a discipline of your mind that says, I'm not just going to gloss over this. I want to see and observe what's going on here. And a good teacher, I think like Rory, when he teaches, he highlights this stuff. Right? But you, you're not doing it from being taught from Rory. You're learning it on your own. You're seeing it for yourself. And there's something radical that happens to you when it begins to sink into you in your own understanding. I think I get this. You know, you can hear it, and most times you're going to leave a sermon, and you're probably going to remember it for how long. We would like to flatter ourselves and think people will never forget this. <laughs> Truth is, I forget it on the third day. And, and God knows this, but these little things that we pick up on are things that, in time, they change our lives. In time, they, they work to kind of change the way we think and the way we process, the way we observe things. You're going to be all the more keen about when somebody says something that's out of context, you go, huh, where did you get that? And how did you get that? So observation, what's the next one? Then, and with all that, we're looking for transformation. transformation. We're looking for the, you know, and finally ending up trying to a title. I'm going to take this whole thing. I'm going to put it down in just a couple, two or three words. So we'll work on that next week and get into the next assignment. And then we're done with the next assignment. We're going to take it and contrast it the next story with this story. See what the relationships are. And we went into the third assignment. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at it and say, okay, this is what I learned in this passage. This is what it meant to me, but I'm seeing that he's, this is happening here, this is happening here, this is happening here. What is the author getting at? You know, as you're going to see, there is something he is driving home. And you'll, you guys will see it. Trust me, you will see it. He's driving a point home in all of it. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to dismiss you. Um, you're welcome if you want to try to take the next sheet and try to look at your interpretation, see what you're learning from the passage. That way, when we start next week, you might, we might want to um, throw out some ideas that you have and we'll see how far off or what or whether you need to leave the class or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. Lord, it's, it's so good for us to be together. 
And Lord, even after all my years, Lord, I just, I know there's so much you want to teach me. And I pray, Lord, that tonight you would give all of us, God, a heart to be learners. Lord, that we look at your word and we would see, God, that there's something in it that is transformational in our lives, that your spirit, Lord, awaken us. Even going through this exercise this evening and observing the things we're observing, I pray, Lord, there'd be things you'd speak to us about in our own life so that we don't miss the point of what you want to communicate with us. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone here. I pray, God, that you give them a, just a real um, confidence, Lord, not in themselves, but, Lord, in you, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would open up their hearts and minds to receive from you. And so we commit these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, by the way, somebody asked me, the brother back there with my phone number, if you get stuck on something and you wanted to, to call me, you're welcome to do that. If I don't answer, I'll call you back. My phone number name is Doug Snow, and the number is 503, still a Portland number, 998-3330, if you would want that. 503-998-3330, and both Janet and I, I'll give you her number, Ladies, want to talk to the wife? She'd be more than happy to talk to you. I know that. 503 for Janet. 998. Nine eight five eight, And that should really impress you. Because I know her number. Some of y'all don't even know your own phone number, so it's like, <laughs> anyway, God bless you guys.